<clears throat> I believe next on our agenda is uh, Stephen, so we'll just roll right into that. Yeah. And by the way, thank you all for the very active participation. This is this is phenomenal. This is exactly what we hope for. There's more to come. <laughs> uh, just on Andrew's point, like that question, uh, there's a, a poll later on as with some suggested uh, uh, future work and writing tools to convert logger data files into the data model is one of the suggestions. So hang around and vote for that and it might get on the uh, the roadmap for development. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go into a bit more detail on what the data model is and how it's structured and go through the GitHub repo as well. But Amit's covered some of that, so I'll cut that short. Um, so yeah, Gita, so I'm Stephen. I am based in Ireland and I work for Brightwind. Brightwind is a wind energy consultancy. We do energy yield assessments and I've been working in wind analysis since 2003. Um, and I've been part of the task 43 since um, a year and a half ago, I think. Now coming up to two years now, I think. Um, so I'll, I've got these slides here in case my internet goes. I plan not to use them. I plan to use the web browser all the time. Uh, so I'll start off with the actual data model and step through what the data model is and explain a bit about the um, the structure. So this is the exact same demo data file that's in the GitHub repository that Amit showed. Uh, I've just got it in this tree viewer, which makes it easier to and less daunting to work through. Uh, so at the very start, you've got some high level details, uh, plant name, the date this was created, what organization, author, and the version of the data model that's been used. So this is based on the version one of the data model, which was released just last month. So the first thing we have is a measurement location. You see these square brackets here, that means it's an array, so you can have a list of measurement locations. And what we call a measurement location is a location on the ground, it's a uh, latitude and longitude location on the ground on a map. So this is the point at where this measurement station, the MetMast, solar station, LIDAR, whatever it is, is located on the ground. So the two bits of important information is the latitude and longitude uh, in here. And then there's the measurement station type, and this is for a MetMath, but we've got other station types that you can have. Um, and then every single section will have a note, so you can write anything you want, uh, and a date that this piece of information was updated. So we can keep, this is more, this updated at, and in the database, there's it updated by, so that can help you track logs of what things changed when and by whom. So I should back up and say that this, this data model foundation design is based on a database design, relational database design, I should say. So we try and follow the normalization rules as much as possible. And we kind of designed it as a database first with the mind that it's a the actual schema is a JSON schema, but the database and the schema match perfectly. And the database, we use the database rules just to design it and to structure the different components of a MetMask. And there's quite a lot and it gets complicated. So this measurement location, the two bits of important information, well, the name, the location, latitude and longitude. Uh, and I'll go back to when I'm showing you the schema, explain, why this? So as part of a measurement location, a mast in this case, we have mast properties. So a very basic, it's a lattice triangular uh, mast. So there's lattice square and pole, um, which matches the IEC um, um, structures. Um, then we've got some OEM serial number of the mast. Uh, the mast height is whatever it is. So some of these are required and some of them are not required and that's all in the schema as well. And there's the notes and update. And as part of each mast, this is the lattice triangular. So you have mass section geometry. So because it's a lattice triangular, you've got lattice face width 
at the bottom of the section, lattice face width at the top of the section, the leg width, the, whether it's round, cross section or square, the number lattice brace and member diameter, the number of brace and members, um, brace and member height. So all this information, along with the lattice triangular, allows you to verify whether uh, a particular anemometer is compliant with the IEC recommendations. So you need all this information to, to verify that. So that's why this is here. So for a lattice triangular mast, usually they're the same cross sections all the way up the mast, but they may not be. Hence, this, this is an array, so you can have several different mast section geometries. And we've got this ID here, so it can match to uh, the mountain arrangement that the anemometer is mounted on at that particular section. I can go back to that later. So that's just the the, sec the mass section geometry. Um, if you've got a LIDAR, we have another different section for vertical profiling properties. Um, so this is the mass, so that's not shown here. The other main thing is then the logger. So this is called logger main configuration. And um, reason it's main, it's like what's the logger, the main logger program. As you can see from the bits of information here, you got the serial number, logger name, ID, manual, the OEM, firmware version, date from and date to. I'll come back to that. But the logger main configuration covers like um, offset from UTC, sampling rate, averaging period, timestamp is the clock auto synced, uh, logger acquisition uncertainty. Um, so that's the main things that the logger, the main properties that the logger has. Again, this is an array, so you can have many loggers on the one mass over a period of time. So that's what this date from and date two does. So you initially install the mast and it has a logger. So this one just has the one logger. But if the logger got hit by lightning or just failed for some reason, you put in a new logger. So you'll have a new serial number. Hopefully it's the same locker model, uh, so you've got consistency. And um, because it's an NRG, it could have the same logger ID because that can be programmed, but the serial number distinguishes it. And so you put a data to of when the old one stopped and you create another uh, one of these in the same in, in this list and the new date from. And when it's a null in the date to, that essentially means it's still operating. So there's a lot of information captured there and it's called the logger main config. So then we get to the actual measurement measurements. So this measurement point, the idea behind this name is that you've already specified your location on the ground, uh, your latitude and longitude, and now you want to, you have a, an anemometer mounted at a certain height above that location. So now you've got to an actual measurement point above the mast. Um, and this measurement point doesn't contain much information itself. It's effectively uh, a way to map together logger measurement configs. So that's what the slope and offset is programmed into the logger for this particular measurement point. Um, what sensor and what calibration slope and offset, its mountain arrangement, so what its particular boom length is, upstand height, and linked to the mass section geometry that I mentioned earlier. So the measurement point itself just has a name and a measurement type, so it's wind speed and a height. So this height is the actual height of the instrument, and we have a reference, it's above ground level. Um, so if we go into the logger measurement config, so this is what's programmed into the logger for this measurement. Uh, so you can see the slope and offset that was programmed into the logger, sensitivities for solar, its units as a result of the slope and offset. The height that's typed into the uh, logger is 80, and that is not necessarily the actual height. So that's why there's the difference between the two. The serial number that's typed into the logger, the connection channel, so it's an NRG logger, so it's connected to channel one, and this has a date from. So this configuration that was programmed into the logger uh, persisted between these two dates, and you can see those only 
uh, three days uh, because in the list of logger measurement configs for this 70 meter speed 80 meter uh, one the uh, the logger program was changed so it seems like the offset was typed in incorrectly they noticed it after three days and so it was corrected to the correct uh, offset and that's why this changed so then this one was persistent from the 15th all the way to the end of the the measurement campaign so this is how we can track changes for a measurement point that's programmed into the logger uh, the subsection of this is the column name so as it's, it's pointed out channel one is connected to channel one so with energy loggers if you got something connected to channel one the column headings in the actual time series data file is going to be channel one average the rest are listed here standard channel one standard deviation channel one max channel one min and um, other loggers will have other kind of standard con naming conventions and um, so this is how you link this measurement point this wind speed at 80 meters orientated 315 degrees i'll get to that with the mountain arrangement is connected to this channel one in the actual time series data files so what this whole data model is doing is if you've got a time series data if you've got a column of information channel one average with values wind speed values and this whole data model gives this column of data meaning so you know exactly what was programmed into the logger to create this data file you know what sensor it was where it was mounted all that good stuff and this is how you can connect this metadata data model to the time series data so that's that's the logger measurement config and it's completely independent to the sensor one thing i always think of with the metmast everything can change on a metmast completely independent of everything else and that's what makes this structure quite complicated uh, and possibly one of the reasons why it's taken so long to do this. So the sensor is completely independent of what was programmed into the logger, uh, but it's still mapped to this wind speed at 80 meter, 80.1 meters. So the sensor that was mounted at this height is a thes. You've got the model serial number, classification, the instrument point of point of interest is POI so this is explained in the documentation what POI means point of uh, interest was a bit too comp too long to write down uh, so this is the basically for an anemometer at the bottom of the instrument to the center of the cups which is also used for the IEC um, um, validation and you got the date from and date to again uh, so a sensor can be replaced over time and you just put in your date two, put in a new a new JSON for the other object and could for the other anemometer. It might not be a thesis. Hopefully it is a thesis, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and you can track changes over time. There's a subsection of this, which is calibration. So this is the calibration certificate you get for, uh, for that particular anemometer. Uh, so you have as uh, me measurement types, uh, the calibration slope and offset, uh, the report file name, date of calibration, uh, calibration organization, place of calibration, uncertainty, and then we've got a table of all the uncertainty values for each uh, reference bin. Uh, There's a lot of information to type out, and this was one of the first things we did after getting the main data model working uh, um, we went and spoke to lots of the calibration facilities and Heiko from Deutsche Wingard has we have together produced a digital calibration certificate so there's a whole uh, data model for calibration certificates and now there's a tool to just convert that and insert the data into this one um, which will save us a lot of time and effort typing out all these numbers for calibration. 
So that's a, a sensor. So there was just the one sensor at this measurement height. And um, then we've got the mountain arrangement. And um, so again, everything can change independent of everything else. And um, so for this mountain arrangement, we've got the measurement type as a go post. And um, this mass section geometry ID is the UUID that uh, I referenced before when talking about the mass section geometry. This is where you can link the two together. So you'll have your mass properties, your lattice and lattice face widths, and it has an ID, and then you can link that back to this. In this case, this is a goalpost mounted, so there is no mass section geometry re uh, relative to this measurement height. Uh, we've got the boom orientation of 315 degrees, hence the name, um, speed 80.1 orientated 315 degrees, and the boom orientation is here. Uh, if this was an, a wind vane, you'd have a vein dead band orientation, orientation reference, there's tilt angles, um, the boom information, the upstand height, boom diameter, boom length. And this is from mass, uh, mass to sensor. Um, so now you've got all the information to automatically validate whether your anemometer was mounted according to IEC recommendations or not. All that information is there. Um, and again, this is a list, so the mountain arrangement can change. The example that is a vein deadband orientation, usually wind vanes get mounted along the boom, but you could have the wind vane pointed towards the mast for the first part of your campaign, then it fails and someone comes along and replaces it, but points it away from the mast. So now you need to be able to say, well, my boom, or my vein deadband orientation was uh, 135 degrees for the first part and then using your date from and date two you can put in another uh, section where you have a different vein deadband orientation so you've got all captured all those kind of changes that can happen on a mast uh, then we've got interference structures so this is mostly like lightning rods lightning finials and um, we re relate these objects relative to the mast center so the distance and the orientation from the mast center. And then if you're at this interference structure then related to this measurement point, so then you can actually work out uh, where that interference structure is relative to the anemometer and see what kind of analysis you need to do or filtering out. And um, so this mast has 13 measurement points. I might go to one that might have some, uh, I've just checked this. So this one, this uh, speed 80 meters southeast. So here I previously, I used 315 degrees here. You can use southeast and this name is completely independent. You can make it whatever you want. And the, the metadata is what describes it. So this gives you flexibility. Uh, in this case, we've got two sensors. So between the 12th and the 18th, so this anemometer only lasted four days and then it was replaced by by a different, uh, yeah, the serial number is different, different anemometer and its calibrations will be different. If I see the two, four, five, seven, five, and yeah, so they're different. So yeah, I'll move on quickly. And um, so that's effectively an implementation of the data model for a MetMast. So I think the other side of this screen is the schema itself. So this is the schema. You kind of don't need, well, hopefully you never need to know the details of in this and because there'll be tools so you it's just hidden and you never need to know it but this is basically the schema and if i just quickly drop down to a uh, measurement location because it's not too far down um the schema gives you the instructions of how to structure your json file and um, that's that's all it does it's a blueprint to follow and because you've got structure, you can use it for validation. So I mentioned the measurement. Um, the measurement location has a latitude and longitude. Can I have the two 
have, no, not really, uh, have the latitude and longitude for a measurement location. So we've got an object measurement location and a property in the measurement location is a lat the latitude. So the, the, the title, the, the attribute name, a title if you need a different title. So this is a title that can be swapped out when doing putting on tables or making the data look good as opposed to having lowercase and underscores everywhere. And um, so you can, we've got the titles to make um, tables look good. Then there's the description. And uh, so um, we specify that it's a latitude and uses decimal degrees. And we specify the coordinate system that it's used uh, specifically. And we say that it's between minus 90 and plus 90. So in the schema, there's examples. So 52.93 and there's some validation. So minimum minus 90 and maximum 90. And same with the longitude. Um, so we've got minus 180 to plus 180. Um, so that's that's the schema. So um, how am I doing for time, Jason? Sorry. Uh, we are a bit over time, so I think I would I would move to wrap up and give folks uh, a little bit of a break. Yeah, yeah let me uh, do a few things here in this GitHub repo. I mean, it's done a few already. So, so this is the GitHub repository. Um, in here, you can find the demo data file and the actual schema itself. Uh, the schema is there, but because we're doing version control and releases, we've got releases here on the right. So you can see the most recent release 22 days ago is version one. And in this releases area, we've got the three releases so far, version 0 0.1 and 1.1. And we're at 1.0. Uh, this information here is everything that's changed since the previous version. Uh, and it's from the changelog file. So there's a changelog file in the repository. And so this is just an extract from it. Every single issue, every single change here has an issue associated with it. And you can actually link, click this link to go to that particular issue and see the conversation and why this change was made. Uh, so there's quite a few changes down below. We have the assets associated with it. And this is the JSON schema. So this is the JSON schema that matches that version one. That's the calibration certificate. <laughs> this is the one for the data model, and that's the one for the digital calibration certificate. So the two are there. So if you're writing any code to to link back to uh, the actual version one, this is where you get it from. Uh, the the schema in here, we do have a dev branch and a master branch, and the master branch is always kept up with that matches whatever the release is, but there can be times when it doesn't, just in case you go to the releases. Um, this is the issues, uh, as, as Amit said, um, you can create an issue. We've got 67 closed issues. Um, the discussions Amit has mentioned before, our meeting notes are pinned up here. We have a, every second week we have a general meeting and all the notes are here and the other second week is technical discussions, so those meeting notes are there, and a lot of the technical stuff is in those issues. Um, we have uh, a Kanban board for tracking the progress of all the different issues. So these are all the issues in the backlog. These are the ones to do. Uh, so these are all issues. This is the way we track our work. We see what's in progress and what review is in and then they get moved to done. So you can see uh, everything that we plan to do and when we plan to do it or what's the priority list. So hopefully after this workshop, we'll be able to put in a lot more tasks here, issues to work on and fill this in. Um, so do, yeah, and um, one of the tools Amit mentioned uh, is um, loading the data model into um, into a Jupyter Notebook. So that's a tool here. There's a launch binder here, which 
I have done already. So this, when you click that link on the GitHub homepage, you get this notebook and you can just run through this notebook and it loads in that uh, demo model that I went through and you can see the high level information, uh, what measurement locations are there and there's some code to extract all the JSON um, and then you can see measurement points. So you got all the different measurement points. There's the 80 meter point one at 315 degree orientation and that's its name and we kind of took a look at that one. Um, so also on the GitHub repository is the form app that someone asked about. I think this is, uh, so you launch it from here. So it opens this other window. So this form web app is just somebody wrote code and for JSON schema. So the JSON, this converts JSON schema into a form to fill in. Um, so you can get to it from GitHub page and if I just type in a few things here, so this is helping you fill out and populate the J the the JSON. Uh, yep. So if you notice here that it was red, it doesn't match the pattern that's in the schema. Um, so that is a bit of validation. I was, I just write anything for the plant. Uh, and if I move down here, you can see the JSON is being rendered down here. This is everything that I've typed in. So this is a way to to create, populate a data model. So we've got the measurement location, so we can do speed 80 meter north, uh, 54 minus eight. It's a mast. Uh, you can see the different options that are in the um, data model. So there's a vertical scan in LiDAR, SODARS, float in LiDAR. But again, I think we've captured quite a lot, but there might be some things that we're missing, uh, solar. Um, so you can pick those other things. And then you can get into the mast properties, uh, vertical profiler properties um, that for LiDARs, it has device data and plane height, uh, device orientation because the thing can be mounted um, not north. Um, and you got the logger configuration, the measurement point information. So when you fill out this information, the JSON gets rendered down here. So you got measurement location, slash student and longitude, a measurement point name, and this form helps you fill it out. You see what's highlighted in red is required. So we needed a wind speed, um, the height is required, the rest isn't. And um, so that, this is a way to fill out uh, a data model. Um, now I just need to go back to my slides to see what I've forgotten. Um, the web form, GitHub repository. I think I've run out of time, but uh, the digital calibration certificate that we were talking about has its own subfolder. So it has its own README. Um, Heiko's put a lot of work into this. Um, you see the structure here. It captures everything that goes into a calibration certificate, uh, a lot more than a wind analyst needs to pull out. Um, but this has the slope and offset here in the linear regression section of the results part of the digital calibration certificate. So this has, it's structured very similar to the data wind resource assessment data model. And I don't have time to go through it at the moment. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, we are a little behind schedule, but that is perfectly fine because We've had great conversation. So what I would like to do uh, is take a break and we will come back at uh, 40 past, so 13 minutes from now. Um, does that sound reasonable to you, Stephen? And I think Gibson, you're up next. Did you say 22 the hour? Uh, yes. 40 minutes. 40. Yeah, so yeah. Fine yeah, that's great. Yeah. Fine for me, thank you. Okay, all right, we'll see you all back. 
at uh, 20 till the hour. Great, thanks. Feel free to stay on, chat if you would like, grab a coffee, whatever. Um, we're happy to uh, answer any questions as well. Hey, Stefan. Great job. Yes. Hi, Anna Maria. Yeah. We have also done some kind of what you call them form. We call it. I call it template. It was very nice to now to kind of make the connection between terms. I mean, it's a we have a user say that it's a it's um something from um done from Stanford University to make our form for the metadata. But this is most yeah. more interesting because this one is a, is a, you is yours. I mean, is a is independent of other places. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a pretty good. I didn't know anything about this. This was um, Florian from EDF that came up with this. It's in the GitHub repository. You just put a plugin. There's some way to put a plugin into the GitHub, yeah. and it's totally driven from the schema like we didn't yeah. code anything and it's totally driven from the schema so all the restrictions all the requirements all the formats for the different values is all taken from the schema uh, yeah, which is true. great uh, it's it's one source of truth the schema yeah, for then, everything else and then you have the the vocabulary for the each term so where that uh, yes, like yes. variables and so on, and then vocabulary for for mass geometry and uh, yeah, 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 that is, yeah, a, 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 yeah, yeah that's there's, a, there's, there's a lot nice. in it. Uh, it uh, if you want to fill out a whole met mass with thirteen or fifteen, sixteen measurement points, it can get tedious. But it's doable and you can actually you can actually take you can do one measurement point and then take the structure and put it into something like this. This is this yeah. is an editor as well. So you can actually edit this and you can actually I love I that also. Think, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah, you can copy sections so you can create one measurement point and then yes. copy it and then fill it in. Um, the actual values for each particular measurement point. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's, there's there's ways to populate it. All right, um, and I didn't I didn't get to show the um, the database. So as I was saying, it's the structures designed on database. So we actually did. At the same time we did the JSON structure and the database at the same time. And so we've got all these create table SQL statements and then all the enums that are part of it. Um, so the onshore, offshore, mass slider, all of these things in yeah. here, which is a pretty, uh, yeah. And then create every single table that's used and they're all got their foreign keys and relations and everything. Uh, I think it's pretty good. I think we could, do with a lot more work on that database side to help people um, interact with the database. So I think the database is like, it's the, the place that this data should be structured and it can track changes over time. And then you just have a tool to export from the database to the data model and then send it to some or the other organization like, uh, a consultant, wind consultant, and if they're using windographer, wind pro, wind farmer analyst, if those tools can uh, have an import function, they just load it in, load in the time series data, and they've got all the metadata they need to run their automated uh, functions like windographer has automatic filters for mass shadowing, uh, but you have to type in the, uh, the boom orientation and things like that. So. We should just type it in once and never again for anyone. 
for that matter. While we're talking databases, Stephen, I have a question. Um, so, so far this has been reused with uh, relational SQL type databases. Um, yeah, it feels like it might be a nice next step to explore uh, essentially larger data stores that can operate in a more event driven way, like your BigQuery, um, because you could treat <coughs> entries of data as events and then uh, you can simply to to solve all the uh, to and from date problems. You essentially mm -hmm. walk through the event queue um, in your in your time series database uh, and arrive at a, mm -hmm. at a fixed point uh, with with all your your history in the past. Uh, and yeah. and they're starting to get quite powerful for just kind of injecting data straight into th tools like pandas and dashboards and stuff like that. Um, so it might be a neat feature. Mm. Yes, yeah, so do those databases, they track changes. So you have an event and it tracks the change. So you can, yeah. instead of replicating, you you uh, just change the thing that changed, the item, the pro yeah. property that changed. Yeah, that, that, exactly. that does, I don't, I don't have any practical experience with using those types of databases. Uh, but it does sound interesting, so it does. Yeah, I haven't had that much experience in the past, but I'm starting to get into it with the AeroSense project. If if Sarah's on here, we we have a have a database like that for AeroSense. Um, so I'll I'll know more over the next few months. Actually, be a bit more informed. But that's specifically when for databases for um, con consultants, consultants. I mean. You have also data with uh, together with metadata. I mean, your idea is to have the metadata and the data. A time series. Yeah. yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And I think you know. I mean, what I appreciate about your comment, Tom, is that in a lot of ways we can look at the schema and what we've been reviewing here as. Uh, more of a logical model, right? Uh, which right now we've just physical, the physical implementation mirrors exactly that logical model. Oh, yeah, but yeah, that yeah. doesn't mean that we couldn't <clears throat> explore uh, other physical implementations, other physical formats that might operate uh, more optimally, more efficiently. No, no, for certain yeah, totally operations. get it. I think that's your point, right? Yeah, totally, totally get yep. it. And like the, the physical, looking at the actual physical system is always, always, always the right way to build a schema. Um, if you do it any other way, it, it, it goes wrong. Like it, it always maps to actually how the system is. Um, so, you, you know, you need people like you folks who really understand the system to build it. Yeah, yeah, I've spoken to, I've worked with a few software developers over the decade and uh, they think, oh, I've met Matt's time series data easy and yeah. then you explain about slope and offsets and how it can be programmed incorrectly in the logger and how you have a calibration slope and offset and then they realize actually this is this is pretty complicated have you um dealt with time zones fully in here because we came across uh -oh. a, a problem last year where um we discovered that basically all the wind resource assessment data that we had w was finally time stamped plus or minus an error of 12 hours because we didn't know whose watch had set the data logger um, well, some time. Yeah. Is, is there a you know an enforced utc standard in there and um, well to force a logger to whatever timestamp, uh, that problem doesn't really exist anymore because a lot of the loggers have uh, linked to uh, time servers on the internet mm -hmm. and reset every time they connect to the internet, so every day. But yeah, I remember yeah back in 2003, 2005 when we had older loggers and you, you only visit them once every three months and it could be off by drift by a few hours over those three, three months. But yes, it, it, <laughs> the initial time in the first place could have been set to whatever time and you don't really know and um, that doesn't really exist anymore in the schema all we can do is have what's the time relative to utc what's the uh 
offset in hours from UTC. But, it, but is, is that actually way. in the schema, though? Yes, yes, that's in the schema. That's the main thing, because most of the data that we've had, like there's there's been literally no offset applied. So even if the logger is kind of synced on the network time protocol, um, it, it, it'll be at the correct time in Vietnam, but then not add yes. what the offset is. Yeah. Yes, yes. All the all the loggers, the timestamp in the time series data part. So you have a wind speed value of five meters per second at 10 past 12 on the 1st of January. Yeah. They never have time zone. So, but in the header, there should be, and there is mostly like uh, what it's offset from UTC. And so that can be pulled from the logger file and put into the schema. Gotcha. So yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and in, in, in addition to that, we also have the, if it's the beginning or the end of the timestamp, which is another thing that uh, some loggers and some lighters have, uh, it start, where it starts averaging is, can be in the beginning or in the end. So we made sure to include that piece as well in the data schema, which is important for, more for MCP analysis than, you know, it's not much of a big deal if you're 10 minutes off from one side or the other, but it is so, when you're doing, you know, correlations across mass in the in the project. Which was exactly the question I was just about to ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sharing my screen again. Uh, you can see the offset from UTC in hours here, and then uh, the sampling rate, averaging period in minutes. Um, like it could be decimal minutes. Uh, Generally in wind, it's not, it's 10 minutes. And then timestamp is end of period, true or false. And that's where that information is captured. Offset from UTC in hours, huh? I didn't think I'd fall in love on this call, but I have. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> yes. um, it's so rare. <laughs> The, the majority of the efforts, like it took a solid year to come up with this and the structure relating things to each other was difficult, but the hardest thing was coming up with the names. Um, put a lot of thought and tedious effort was put into getting names that say what they mean. <laughs> And then the description to go with the schema. So every single property in the schema has the name and then a description associated with it to explain exactly what it is. Uh, so I hope that is all very useful for people. Yeah, and it's that attention to detail really shows. Well done. Thanks. I think I would like to speak to you about uh, a certain point about how to integrate what we have done in RP Wind for this uh, for the metadata schema and then do what you have done because I think that it's uh, it's a part of a, of, a, of that one. Because we we go yeah. through all the the, the the cycle of all the data from the wind wind farm life cycle. And this is a is the first part. Is, wind of sort of exciting which is mm. quite interesting yeah yep reach out um you're on slack you send send me a message absolutely yeah. i see a, a hand up by yeah. edward yeah that's that's me hey hey steven um I had a question about the some of these smart sensors, kind of like the the T's 3D 3D ultrasonic or the LUF sensors. When I'm when I'm looking at the sensor, when I you know obviously I do multiple measurements. Um, yeah. And, and so how does that how does that play into the model for the sensors? So, um, you have a sensor that measures multiple things yes that, yes so uh, a sensor can be part of many measurement points so 
um, your sensor, what is it, a, a 3D ultrasonic? So it measures wind speed and direction. Yes. So you can have a measurement point that measures wind speed and it's connected, it's associated with that particular sensor. So you know, it's 3D sonic. And then you have another measurement point that's wind direction and it's the same sensor. So uh, in a JSON, you can only do parent child. In a database, you can do many to many relationships or one to many. So in the database, I'm not too sure if it's there in the database or it, it is on my list to put in, is that you can have a mapping between them instead. So the JSON file that comes out will have to be parent-child, but in the database, you put in the one sensor, the one information for that sensor, and then you just map it in the database. And then when you do an export from the database, you'll get the parent-child. Um, sure, so let sure, me just okay. look, look in yeah, this yeah. SQL, uh, so create tables. Stephen, I think we should um, we should proceed. Yeah, go oh, on. I'll, I'll, I'll look up this. And I'll I'll message you. Ed. That'd be great. Thanks. Um, let's pass it to Gibson.